If this fact, in fact, turns out to be the Eastern Conference Finals, you can sign me up for seven games. This one had 20 lead changes, including eight in the final five minutes alone. Giannis had a strong game overall, finishing with 34 points, 12 rebounds, and seven assists, although the Nets took the book on defending him to an extreme. Y you know how most teams give Giannis space from deep? Well, Brooklyn gave him basically an entire county, mm. averaging 15 feet of pad, the most any player <laughs> has been afforded from three <laughs> since Second Spectrum began us. tracking this stuff eight seasons ago. Now, the Nets were much more physical with Giannis otherwise, though. Check the little shove there from Nah, but he, he initiated that. He <laughs> stepped in front of somebody. I'd be mad if I was KD, too. Harden, meanwhile, finishing with 34, including hitling, hitting that little float, that uh, shot to put the Nets up one. He also had that driving floater. Giannis would answer with a two-handed putback. A little authority there. But it was Durant who would have the last word, draining the go-ahead three on a pass from Harden. Look at that. Afterward, both players discuss why they seem to be meshing together better now than even when they played together in OKC. We were young uh, in Oklahoma City. You know, we're, we're grown men now. You know, we know what we want. We know, we really know the game of basketball now. Um, you know, we're not those young guys that just run around and want to just shoot and, and dunk all day. We done been through a lot in this league, experienced a lot. And um, for us to bring it together now and, and, and combine what we've learned over this time, and try to play great basketball, I think it was pretty seamless for us. Yeah, it is nice when the NBA looks like the regular NBA, with fans screaming and arenas full of energy and players who can take the court each night without someone sticking a Q-tip up their nose three times a day. But as we saw yesterday, anyone who tells you what's going on this season isn't real basketball is missing just how much spectacular there still is to see. So we will get to Kyrie's sound in a moment. But from last night's Ooh. Nets win, Paul, what was your biggest takeaway? Man, this is scary. <laughs> I'm not even on. Because, look, they're only two games in. They beat mm -hmm. the top seed in the Eastern Conference. And they haven't even got their chemistry together yet. I mean, yeah, they're scoring points and getting assists. They're turning the ball over a lot. So yeah. you got to expect those to come down in the next few weeks as they get to know one another, as they implement Kyrie Irving. But... Man, like I said earlier, it's like having Jordan and Jordan on the same squad. Yeah, yeah. it's like, no. the, who's number two? No, I, 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 I kid you not. <laughs> I mean, seriously. With all due respect to the two-time MVP, the two best players in the Eastern Conference are on the Nets, right? And it's James Harden and it's Kevin Durant. And mainly Man. the reason why I say that is not because of Giannis' defense and all that. It's more because when it comes down to the last 30 seconds of a game and you're in the postseason or you're in a, a moment where you need it, they have the two best players in the conference uh, when it comes to knocking that down. So the postseason is going to be... Could be three with Kyrie. Oh, well, yeah. Well, obviously, when, Ky when you're talking I mean, about the last 30 seconds, I mean, like, yeah. you know, Kyrie talking about, you know, I finally have somebody that can knock down that shot. Well, <laughs> now congratulations. Now you got two of them. <laughs> now, now you got two. <laughs> now you got two of them. And, and look, this is the problem, too. You talk about the end of a playoff game. I mean, we're skipping some steps here, obviously. But you talk about the end of the playoff game with Giannis. I mean, you guys always tell me a big man, that's a tough position to put a big man in to be depending on him finishing, especially if he's struggling at the free throw line. And, and we saw Giannis was better at the line last night. He had that game against the Mavericks the other night where I think he was one of 10 for the line. But his free throw shooting overall, guys, this season, he's at 59%. Four years ago, he mm. was at 77%, and it's yeah. just gone down every year well, since. Well, pressure, like when people talk about pressure, a lot of times it, it rears its head in different places, right? Giannis now feels the pressure to win a championship. He feels the pressure to be MVP. And sometimes that pressure is not going to show up in your ability to dunk. It's going to show up in like the moments and in those little bitty things, whether it's a three point, whether it's your free throws, and you can see the decline. So I don't know, as the pressure has gone up and his free throw percentage has gone down, like physically, he's still one of the most dominant guys we've ever seen. But like that pressure and the technique, that's where it's starting to show in his game. He needs a closer. Simple and plain. He needs a superstar closer like Shaq had Kobe and Wade. Mm -hmm. He needs that guy. I'm not sure Middleton could be that guy. He's a great piece and he's having a great year. He'll be an all-star. Mm -hmm. But we saw how they struggle down the stretch. And if Giannis can't make free throws or hit perimeter shots consistently down the stretch, then who's going to be that guy? And that's why I just don't have faith. Regardless of Milwaukee Bucks, they may finish first in the conference. I just don't have faith in them come playoff time because of that. And look at that shot. Now, this is the thing. Milwaukee Bucks fans, we're not saying that your team isn't great. We're not saying that you can't win. Say, you can't get to the conference finals. We're not saying that you can't you win You guys are just talking about the most elite level. These well, guys yes, are champions. We're, we're just, they're talking yeah. about that nuance of the most yeah, elite you need to 
Absolutely. Well, let's just say the last two shots, right, the last two shots of that game were taken by Chris Middleton, who's a very, very good player and all-star. The last two shots for the Nets will be taken by James Harden, <laughs> Kevin Durant, or possibly Kyrie Irving. Right. Let's just put that in perspective. Three future Hall of Famers versus, you know, all-stars, mm -hmm. right, versus an all-star, right? right? Uh, and I know we're jumping ahead when we talk about that, but you got two MVPs, leading yeah. scorers, all, all these different accolades versus Chris Middleton. And that's not a disrespect. That's just the reality. No, it's just saying Chris Middleton's probably not one of the top five players in the NBA right now, which is an okay it's assessment. It's okay assessment. And, and I wouldn't say they struggled down the stretch. They were going, it was exciting. Lead for lead change, Break point it. for mm -hmm. point, you know, hit for hit. But yes, at the end, it was the Nets who came through. And they will be more powerful, more firepower with Kyrie Irving back. Uh, probably not much longer for him to be out. He practiced for the first time with the team today. And Nets coach Steve Nash said it's great to have him back in the building. He expects Kyrie to play tomorrow against the Cavs. Kyrie missed the last seven games due to personal reasons and COVID protocols. And here he was addressing the media for the first time. Take a listen. I'm wondering if you were aware that you had violated the health and safety protocols and what that process was like for you in coming back and going through that investigation one. And then secondly, what your communication was like with the team while you were away. Happy to be back. Happy to be around these guys, address the team, address everybody that needed to be addressed. Now it's time to move on. I just was circling back on the health and safety front. Happy to be back. Thank you. I'm a hometown kid, so, you know, things hit a little different when, um, you know, family or personal stuff going on. And that's up to me to handle that as a as a man. Um, but, yeah, I just take full accountability for my absence with the guys and, you know, just had a conversation with each one of them and we move on. Just Nobody was watching when he did it in Phoenix. Nobody, nobody was watching when he did it. Richard, <laughs> am I you're lying? You're from Arizona, I, and I and I'm telling you that no one was watching. I talked to everybody from Arizona. That's why. <laughs> it's not kind. Kelly Oubre. Is that his name? That is apparently his name. Listen, man. Welcome to the jump. <laughs> you make I, your first three of the season, you can blow a kiss. You can. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I'm Rachel Nichols <laughs> alongside two men with notable NBA jewelry, 2016 NBA champ Richard Jefferson, 2008 finals MVP Paul Pierce. They don't give you an extra ring for that, Paul, but I feel they oh. should. You got a trophy, though. You got an extra trophy. Got the you got and you have like trophy. a little a replica kind of thing, or they give you one and that's it. You get to keep it. Uh-oh. No, just uh, you got to buy the replica. Oh, you, you got to buy, buy it? You got to buy the replica. Mm, yeah. mm, things you a didn't know one, about the NBA. Okay. <laughs> Coming up, <laughs> Kyrie Irving spoke to the media for the first time uh, just a few hours ago. He talked about taking time off and his outlook going forward as he prepares to return to action on Wednesday. We'll get to that in a minute. First, though. We didn't know what it would feel like. NBA teams playing in the middle of a pandemic, in empty arenas, with fake crowd noise and rosters that on any day resemble a hunk of Swiss cheese. Would games even feel real? Or was this going to feel like watching a season's worth of pickup at LA Fitness? Well, guess what? They're real and they're spectacular, at least when the stars gather like they did <laughs> yesterday. I got that. It turns out if you throw KD, James Harden, and Giannis on one court, and LeBron, AD, Steph, and Draymond on another, some of the best basketball players in the world still play like it, even without teams being allowed to practice much these days. Exhibit A, Curry, finding the basket here. This was nice. That wasn't a foul. <laughs> Finding Draymond on the pick and roll there. That was a travel. Like all the time. <laughs> that was a foul. That was a travel. And then finally hitting this, this was banger monstrous. from 28 feet. There's no hate here. On the clock. That's absurd. Right? Over, Over the Davis. defensive player of the year? <laughs> Come on. What, what, what year was I that? don't know what's more impressive, what that that shot yeah, put the year? Warriors up by five after they've been down by 19 early in the game, or that the six foot three Curry hit that over, as the guys here point out, the outstretched arms of Anthony Davis, and his seven foot six wingspan. It, it was just vintage. Curry would finish with 26. Golden State as a whole appeared to be figuring something out about its rotations. A tweak in substitution patterns certainly seemed to help Kelly Oubre, for one. Still, the Lakers had the chance to win the game in the end. Instead, LeBron passes to Dennis Schroeder, who flings the ball in, uh, I, I guess, the general yes, direction of Alex Caruso. What was going a on? A mess there? ensues. A timeout managed to reset things with 1.7 on the clock. All LeBron could do, launch this three that does not fall. 
All in all, it, it was not a flawless display of basketball. The Lakers in particular got sloppy. Neither LeBron nor AD ever really got going. And the officiating was a topic of conversation throughout. Yeah. But it sure was fun, as was the Nets-Bucks showdown earlier in the evening.